there. Evans turned in. Yes. Okay, get those turned in and I'm going to hand out in two seconds as soon as I take roll. Man, anybody know where everybody is? And then Sam. I don't know. He's here in like six years. He was? Just talking about the test. Yeah, I forgot to ask. What about Charlie? He's already had the test. He took the test. I'm talking about the state tournament. Anybody know where Charlie? No? Yeah. He's trying to sleep in sometimes. Ah. Okay. So we got no Charlie, no Sam, no Ella. Anderson. Anderson Tardy. Anderson, are you still alive? Yes. Oh, All right. Okay, guys, remember tonight we're doing G odds. All right, or tonight, whatever. Monday at midnight, whatever. G odds. Here are the keys to F. And again, there's no way we'll go through all of these in class like before, but it'd be awesome if y'all would uh, try to learn from these. If there's something you don't know. Because that's how I got a lot better back in the day. And there was no internet. It's just every now and then you get a copy of the key and you figure out some little strategy and helps you out. All right, so um, let me just take, well, I'll, tell you, I'll run through the evens. I know they're sitting in front of you, but I'll just go through them quickly if you just want to look at your test. Um, number two was C. Number four was C. Number, oh yeah, by the way, if you're wondering what the heck this key is, um, I accidentally had it on the wrong form when I copied, and it copied front and back, and you can see to the right, that's basically the other sheet inverted because it read it through the paper. Does that make any sense? And I didn't even notice it until it was already done printing. So you can, basically the, the test is just on the left side of each page. I just didn't want to reprint them and waste more paper. So ignore that right side that's literally inside out. Um, it means nothing. So anyway, two is C, four is C, six is E, eight is B, 10 is C, 12 is D, 14 is B, 16 is D, 18 is D, 20 is B, 22 is B, 24 is A, 26 is C, 28 is D, 30 is D, uh, 32 is B, 34 is D, 36 is A, 38 is A, 40 is B, 42 is C, 44 is C, 46 is A, 48 is C, and 50 is B. So, so anybody got a question on one where the key doesn't make sense, you missed it, wanted to know how to do it, uh, maybe see an easier explanation or a harder explanation, who knows. Um, throw out a number and let's take a look. Don't be shy. Number eight. Number eight. 
So number eight asks, find the sum of the absolute values of all the solutions to the equation. And make sure you read that correctly. It's not the absolute value of the sum, it's the sum of the absolute values. So to solve that on number eight, and that also keeps you from finding the sum of the roots the shortcut way, right? The negative B over A, because you don't know whether they're both uh, positive or negative. Um, so anyway, the sum of the roots, I just foiled it out and moved the 15 over to the left and then factored it and solved. And then I took the absolute values, then I added them. But you got to make sure you do it that way. There he is. What else you got? Twenty two. Twenty two. All right, so twenty two is asking what is the value of sine of pi over six, sine of two pi over six, sine of three pi over six? all the way through sine of 2019 pi over six. So I started looking at these and I thought, well, surely they're not going to ac actually need me to do all 2019 of these, right? So I, I just kind of started assuming there would be a pattern. So I wrote out the first few and I saw this. The first one was a half. The next one was square root of three over two. The next one was one. Then I got square root of three over two. Then I got a half. Then I got zero. So I was basically going through all the positive values on my unit circle, except for root two over two, right? And then when I went through the next, the bottom part, right? Because I literally, I'm rotating from zero through the top part, and now I'm going through the bottom part, where the bottom part gives me negative a half, negative root three over two, negative one, negative square root three over two, negative half and back to zero. So basically, every time I go through those, the top, the first half is gonna count out get rid of the bottom half. So at that point, I got to ask myself, well, if that's going to happen, what's going to be left over in this process? If every one, two, three, four, five, six, basically every 12 cancels out, I really just need to check out the remainder that I'm going to end up with. Does that make sense? So I basically, what I did is I assumed every 12 would cancel, and I believe I divided 12 into there, let me see if that's what I did. Divided 12 into 2019 and wanted to see what was left over. Um, 896, yeah. So there were three left over after canceling every 12 out. So I went and grabbed the last three. So the last three were the 2017, 18, and 19. And then I just had to simplify those. Well, 2000, and this is supposed to be 2016 pi, 2017 pi, 18 pi, 19 pi. So if I take those, can I simplify that? What do you do when it's outside the unit circle? You start subtracting what? What do you do when something's a bunch of two pi's? So a, an easy way to subtract two pi's is just to write that as an improper fraction, and then you can get rid of all the evens. So like, if I have 2016 6, that's the same thing as, check it out, that's the same thing as um, 1836. That's the same thing as 330 and, hold on, did I do the math right on this? Sorry, that goes into that six times with the negative zero. So that's the same thing as 336. Oh, sorry, 2017. That's the same thing as 336 and 1 6 pies. So I can get rid of all the evens because 2 pi is a revolution, right? So I could, it's a lot easier to subtract 2 pi from that than it is to subtract 2 pi from an improper fraction. So, right, I mean, from a proper improper fraction. So subtracting 2 pies there just gets rid of all the evens. And I'm left with pi over 6. And then I just made an assumption, well, if I'm increasing by pi over 6 on all these, then those last three must be the same as these first three, which is a pretty good assumption anyway, right? If, I, if I'm thinking that they're repeating themselves over and over, then the first three here should be the same as those three. 
So really, it'd be a lot smarter just to grab these three values and then just add them up. So I just took that three halves, added it with that, and got that. So I think that's something we can do. We just have to try. This is me not assuming the position. I don't look at it and go, what in the world am I going to do with that? I don't have any trick for adding signs. I mean, I do have rules, a sum to product identities, but even that would be awful. Right? So um, I'm just assuming these values, they all are unit circle values. So just I'm just looking for a pattern and assuming that that's the case. And I need to fix that key. What else? Kind of a tricky problem, but I think we can do that if we're, if we're on our game. What else we got? 34. 34. So, yeah, I thought that was kind of tricky. Um, I remember doing it, but I haven't looked at it in a while. Let's see. Two congruent rectangles are each measuring 6 by 14. Overlap is shown. What is the area of the shaded region? Um, so when I looked at this, I thought, okay, if the, each of these are six by 14, then I, I can definitely label each of those ends by six. But if this is 14, I don't know if those are the same or different. I can't make assumptions. I'm assuming they're different. So I said, well, if the total is 14, let me just pick one of them to be X and the other one to be 14 minus X. I chose X in the interior. So that means each of these are X's and then each of those are 14 minus x's. And then I said, okay, I used the Pythagorean theorem right here and said x squared equals six squared plus 14 minus x squared. And I did that to solve for each x. Does that make sense? Because I know that that's a right triangle right there. And that allowed me to solve for x. And then the area of any, um, of any parallelogram is base times height. So I said base times, oh yeah, so I can say the height of this is six, right? The height of this thing, if I look at it kind of from an angle, the base is that, right? And then the height is six, so I can find the area of this parallelogram by just saying base times height. And then the other way I did it is if I didn't see that, I took the area of the shaded was the total area minus twice the area of a triangle. What do I do there? What two triangles? Oh, 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 I found the area of one of these rectangles and subtracted off these two triangles. Okay, yeah, so, I, okay. So one way to do it also would be to say, if I just look at one of these rectangles, I still gotta find X, but if I look at one of these rectangles, I could take the total area, which is just six times 14, the 84, and I could subtract off um, the two non-shaded parts, which would be um, height six times, um, uh, actually the two triangles just make up a total. So I could just multiply the six by the 14 minus X. And that's what I did there. Or I just found the area of one of the triangles. There's the 14 minus X times the six times a half. But since there's two of those, it really is just six times the 14 minus 58 sevens. And I plug that in there and got 348 sevens. So either one of those works great. This second one probably is a little more simple, but you still have to find that X. But that's just me playing around. Um, does that feel like a geometry question you guys would have done in uh, Helmer's class? Doesn't feel like one like I did in Miss Wakefield's class. But um, but I, I thought it was I thought it was doable if you weren't afraid of it and you just started saying, okay, what do I know? Start labeling junk. But I don't I don't know if there's any super direct path there. But the math is just a bunch of a uh, bunch of little formulas, I guess. What else you got? Anything you're missing and want to talk about? 42. Forty-two. All right, I don't remember that one. Huh? Which of the following are true for all real values of x? 
Okay, so which are true? So I looked at number one. Is the definition on number one, it says cosine of x plus pi over 4 is cosine of x plus cosine of pi over 4. Well, I know that cosine of x plus pi over 4 uses the cosine of alpha plus beta identity, right? So that would be cosine x cosine pi over 4 minus sine x sine of pi over 4. And if I simplify that, which is what it really is, is not equal to that, is it? So I got to throw that out. And basically, it looked like they were just saying, can you just distribute a cosine in? But you know you can't because you got to do cosine alpha cosine x beta minus sine alpha sine beta. So you can toss number one. Number two said, um, does the sine of x plus 2 pi end up being the sine of x plus the sine of 2 pi? Well, we know that the sine of x plus 2 pi is the sine of the first times the cosine of the second plus the cosine of the second sine of the first. Now, don't just assume that it's not right because it doesn't look, because it might simplify to that. But you can see right here that that simplifies to a negative, I'm sorry, that simplifies to 1 and leaves me sine x. And sine of 2 pi simplifies to 0. So all this simplifies is, is to sine of x. Well, sine of x is not equal to sine of x plus sine of 2 pi, so you got to toss number 2. The third one, you should recognize that, that that is an odd identity, right? And sine is an odd identity. Sine of a negative x is equal to negative sine of x. That's true for sine. What else? What, which trig functions are odd? Tangent and then cosecant and cotangent, right? The only ones that are even would be cosine and secant. And what do you do with the negative on a cosine and a secant? Just goes away, right? So that's the odd identity. That's definitely true. But it could be more than just three. And you can clearly see on the answers it is more than three. And if you're really deductive, the only thing that it could be is three and four. So it has to be because you know it's not one and two. So to me, I could jump on D right now because it's not all of them. Um, but just so you look at it, um, cosine of 5x equals 5 cosine x. 2 is right. Oh, yes, it is right. Because on number 2, sine of 2 pi is 0. Are you with me on that? So it turns out 2 doesn't look right, but on sine of 2 pi, um, I just got sine of x. I forgot to simplify the sine of 2 pi, but the sine of 2 pi actually is 0. So 2 does end up working because that right there, sine of 2 pi, does simplify to that. They just kind of snuck that in on me, and I didn't think to simplify it. Um, and then when you get to 4, 4 does not work. You know you can't factor out of 5. So um, you toss 4. You toss, So good thing I didn't just go, oh, well, it must be D. I check four also, find out that doesn't work, and then hopefully I would have gone back and found my error. Um, so it turned out number two worked, number three worked, um, so it must be C. But that's just checking your trig identities, and not really even any horrible ones, you know, just the alpha plus betas and the odd ones. What else? But that could totally be, I mean, even if all you did was know that... Um, that one worked, like, I'm sorry, that three works. If all you knew was that three works, um, if you can eliminate A, it's worth guessing, huh? Because you've already increased your odds to the point where guessing is better than leaving it blank. And if you know that that one does not work, so it's at least one in three, um, uh, I mean, sorry, so you know it's not A and not B, and you can get it down to C, D, or E, well, actually C or D, it's certainly worth guessing on, but I don't. I consider that educated answering. To me, guessing is blindly just looking and grabbing something. That's not going to be an advantage to you. What else you got? Anything you're struggling with on the evens? Come in. Duh. Right. Um, number 30? Okay, number 30. Is says find the vertical asymptote of the inverse function. 
Okay, so I'm going to have to find an inverse function here. I don't know if you remember a problem like this, finding the inverse, but it was on your very first test with me, problem number one on in algebra two. But to find an inverse, what you should know is what do you do to find an inverse? Replace x with y, replace y with x. So that immediately jumps you to here. Now the problem happens. So the, to solve this, to find an inverse, you're going to have to do what? What do you do to solve, to get a function written as a function? Get y by itself. Well, I have two different y's. So i got to find a way to get all my y's on one side. And by the way, this is going to happen over and over in a variety of different ways, whether it's calculus, this class, whatever. So I'm going to cross multiply to get to here. And then I'm going to pretend that these, I'm just, literally, I'm, I'm locked in on y. I want all my y's on one side. So I'm going to move this y over here with this y and move that negative 4x over here with the constants. And then I need to get these y by itself. Well, if this was 5y minus 2y, I know you don't really think like you're factoring, but look, 5y minus 2y, aren't you really factoring a y out to get 3y? Nobody taught you that because that was factoring was above your pay scale maybe in sixth grade. So they taught you that like terms add the coefficients. They taught you that, but it's really factoring. Well, I'm going to do the same thing here. If they both have a y in it, I can factor that y out and I'm left with x minus 1. And at that point, I can divide away the, the x minus 1 just like I would divide away the 3. Now, once I get to here, this is my inverse function. Technically, that's my inverse function, but it's hard to tell what a vertical asymptote is in this form. right? We learned vertical asymptotes were factors in the denominator that didn't cancel. So at this point, it should be easy to see that there's a x equals 1 would be the vertical asymptote of the inverse. Now, there is another way to do that. Anybody got an idea? That's really easy. What do you know about an inverse and a function if you graph them? You're flipping them over the y equals x axis, right? So wouldn't that mean that a horizontal asymptote on the original function would be the vertical asymptote on the inverse? What's the horizontal asymptote on this? I'm sorry, on the original function. What's the horizontal asymptote? y equals 1. Remember the rules? If the powers are the same, you use the coefficients. So if y equals 1 is the horizontal, then on the inverse, remember, all you're doing is switching x's and y's, the vertical x ends up being x equals 1. So if you're really on your game, you can make, it just becomes child's play. That's all you would need to do on this. And I like that a lot better. Um, I don't know why I didn't include that in my key. I guess I was just in teacher mode, but that's what I would do. Or same thing if they said, what is the horizontal asymptote on the inverse? I would go, well, if the vertical asymptote is y equals 4 on this one, then the horizontal asymptote would be x equals 4. I'm sorry, then the vertical asymptote here would be x equals 4. Because again, you're just if you're flipping them over, everything changes from x to y, from y to x. If you flip over that axis. What else? Now the slant asymptote would be a little trickier, so I'd probably suck it up to do the math on that, but if there was a slant. Honestly, if there was a slant, I don't even know if you'd be able to do the math. Because if there's a slant, you have a bunch of powered x's on the top and something on the bottom, it's going to be really difficult to solve. I don't, I don't know that you can do that with the math you have, but I have never seen that. What else you got? 27. 27. All right, another inverse one. Kind of like this. This is very calculus feeling to me, even though it's not calculus, but we do this a lot in calculus. Do you recognize this about a function and its inverse? If a function has a value a point, like f of a equals b. If that's true, then what should be true about its inverse? The inverse of f of b should equal a. Because again, on a function and inverse, all I'm doing is switching x's and y values, right? So what that means is, if you look at this problem on 27, 
if I tell you that f of negative 2 is 5, if I tell you f of negative 2 is 5, then what do you know from that? If f of negative 2 is 5, then shouldn't f inverse of 5 be negative 2? And if f of negative 1 is 3, shouldn't f inverse of 3 be negative 1? Literally, I'm just switching x's and y's. So if I want to find, this is what they're asking me to find. If I'm trying to find f o g inverse of 2, first of all, do you know what the o means? Isn't that the same thing as just saying f of g inverse of 2? So how do I find g inverse of 2? Well, I think, well, if g inverse of 2 equals, call it blah, then shouldn't g of blah equal 2? Right? Well, where do you see g of blah equals 2? Right there, g of 1 equals 2. So if g of 1 is 2, then what's g inverse of 2? 1. And you've got that first part done. And now all you have to do now is do f of 1. Well, they gave me f of 1. f of 1 is negative 5. So. To me, that's one of the easier ones you'll see on here if you make that connection. But you got to make that connection. We, we do this all the time in calculus because... They ask you to do like a derivative of an inverse function, and they give you the function, and you go, oh, no problem. I'll just find the inverse and then take the derivative of it. And you go to find the inverse, and then you realize you don't have the math to find the inverse. Like, say you switch the x's and the y's, and you got this. How are you going to solve for y? I mean, you don't. There's no qu uh, cubic uh, formula that you have that you can solve for y. It just becomes too much. So what we do is we go, well, I may not be able to do that, but if I do recognize this, I can understand which point goes with what, and I won't have to find the inverse. Same thing that happened here. I didn't need to find G inverse. I was able to use values from G right here, values from G to help me out. What else you got? That, that'll show up. I'm, I just feel it. Because they always have some, something like that where you have to think about switching those points. You got to remember, you guys are at a disadvantage because you're juniors. Most people who test in this division, not most, but the most people who do really well in this division are people that either have mastered the absolute crud out of their Algebra 2 and Pre-Cal, and they don't need any really help in calculus. But, you know, the people that have that calculus have more insight into little problems. Even if it's not calculus, they're going to have a little more insight into different strategies, sometimes a little quicker ways to do things than you guys which puts you at a bit of a disadvantage. That being said, most of the time, our juniors do the heavy lifting. We might get a little help from a senior. Like last year, we certainly got a little help from John Robert. He came in first, um, which is funny because I think he came in fifth for us his junior year in his class. He did absolutely no algebra or pre-cal for a year and then showed up and came in first. Um, but that goes to show you maybe the, the calculus helped him out a little bit. What else? 28. Okay, geometry. Let's see what I remember about geometry. 28. Okay. They said in the given circle, chord AB is has a length of 12. So I drew a 12 in there from A to B. It says the measure of arc ADB. A D B is 240. What is the radius of the circle? Why do I not have that as a part of this problem? Okay, hold on. What am I missing here? If the, oh, A D B. Sorry. It says that there's A right there, here's D up here, and here's B right here. So A to D to B is 240. So if all of that's 240, then this angle must be 120. And if that's 120, that arc angle, then that inside angle is 120. And if that's 120 and that's 12, you know that these two lengths are the same because it's a radius. So this is an isosceles triangle. 
And if it's an isosceles triangle, then these must be 30s. And now I have all the angles in one side. I can use law of sines all day on that, right? So if I, the question was to find the, the radius. So I just did sine of 120 over 12 equals sine of 30 over R. And then I just crunched the math out and knew my unit circle values. But the key was knowing that that to that to that was 240, which made that or that 120. All right, what else? Anything, talk to me. Yep. 48. 48. It says for how many inter integer values of X Will the rational expression that simplify to an integer? Okay, so I don't know where this falls under Algebra 2 or Pre-Cal, so it's not like we've done this before. But I thought, what if that was a fraction? If it was a regular fraction with numbers, and I wanted to know if it was an integer, I, I would just do what to see? Like, if I just gave you a huge number in the... I gave you a huge number in the numerator and a smaller number in the denominator. I said, hey, is this an integer? What would you do? You would divide and see if there was a zero remainder, right? So I looked at it and I went, well, let me just divide. So I divided and got that remainder. So it says for how many integral values? So I thought, well, X right there, it said integer. Let me see if there's anything else. Okay, so I looked at that and said, um, what numbers for X would allow this thing to divide? Now, certainly nothing bigger than 50 is going to work because if X is actually bigger than 45, if X is bigger than 45 right here, right, then, um, then this ends up being a fraction. So I thought, well, the bottom number has to be either plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 5, plus or minus 10, plus or minus 25, and plus or minus 50. Those are the only numbers that will divide into 50 evenly, right? And if it's x plus 5 equals those, then I just basically have to solve x plus 5 equal those for all of them. But I can do that, can I? So for each and every one of these, I'm going to get a different x, right? If I solve x plus 5 equals 1, if I solve x plus 5 equals negative 1, these are all different numbers, so I'm going to get different answers for x. So it said how many? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. There'd be 12 different possibilities that could work on something like that. And again, is anybody able to get that with any kind of thinking? It really doesn't fall under a category of something we, we've done. But if you start thinking, okay, I'm not going to, i got to sniff around like a rat in a maze, right, just try to find the cheese. I'm thinking, what would I have done to check to see if it was an integer anyway? I would have divided. So let me divide and think, okay, I need that to either be gone or be a whole number. So what, what could work for me? And those are the only ones that would actually give me. And I guess I did think a little bit more about that. I thought, okay, I, I, I really did think about the actual values. It maybe took a little bit longer than just spitting them out. But. What else? 36. All right, so on 36, they said let f be this piecewise function. It says then the function f is either even, odd, neither even nor odd, both even nor odd. Now, this is f of x. So I thought if it's even, what is the definition of even? It does have y axis symmetry, but what's the definition? In terms of f, I guess is what I'm saying, if it's even, f of x should give me the same thing as what? f of negative x. That's the definition of even. So if I want to check to see if it's even, plug negative x in and see if you get exactly the same thing. So I plug negative x in, right, into each of these, and I ended up getting negative x cubed. I ended up getting, hold on, here's my problem, make sure I'm doing this right. Okay, so I'm sorry. 
So I plugged a negative X into negative, negative X cubed and got positive X cubed. Are you with me? And I plugged negative X into X squared plus four and was unchanged. And then I plugged negative X into positive X cubed and got negative X cubed. All right, but I also have to plug negative X into these. Okay, and that's a little bit different. Maybe you aren't used to that. Because remember, I'm plugging it in for every X. So that tells me that it's X cubed when what? X is, what happens there when you divide by X? I'm gonna divide by negative. Changes the sign and becomes a positive two. So actually it's X cubed when X is bigger than two. Well, it is the same right there. And this one never changed. And if I divide everything through by a negative right there, I get positive two greater than X, greater than negative two. Well, that's this. And then right here, if I divide by a negative X, I get X less than negative two. Well, that's this. So it turns out when I plug negative X in for every single part of my function, which I didn't show the math of that, I just showed you this. You got to remember to plug it in here too, because it, it's a piecewise function that has to go in everywhere. This simplified to that. And that is the same thing as my original function. I did have to put this top part on the bottom and the bottom part on the top to make it look like that way. But if it's the same thing, then it turns out that this was that. So it ended up being even. Are y'all seeing that? I think it's really easy to plug the negative X and get this part and forget that. And if you forgot that, you might've said neither. If neither was an option. Yeah, neither even or odd. Um, but anyway, yeah, it actually ended up being the exact same thing. Does that make sense? Yes, no? What else you got? Come on, there's something you missed. Everybody looks down, avoids eye contact. Well, what do you got? Do y'all think this one was easier or harder? know that I could come up with a way to do that with algebra. It says among all the points which lie on that line, find the value of X, which minimizes the value of the square root of X squared plus Y squared. So um, I substituted the five X, five X minus three in there for Y. You can see that right there. And that gave me this expression. And then I cleaned it up to get this. And then I took the derivative. And um, you guys don't know how to take a derivative. Uh, you will in probably a week uh, and a half. You'll be pretty good on taking derivatives. And, but you still probably won't learn even at that point because we're just doing mechanics of derivatives this year. But a derivative gives you a slope. And if I take a derivative, I can find out where the slope is zero. Well, where do slopes of zero occur on a graph? Think about it. If a graph goes up, its slope is changing but at maximums and at minimums, you get slopes of zero. So if you take a derivative of something and set it equal to zero and solve, you can find out where the x's equal zero. And zero could be where the maxes or mins occur. And then the other thing I did, as I said, you could possibly plug in every X value, I guess that gave you a bunch of X values. Yeah, the, I guess the other option is just guessing and checking. So if you made this substitution, it said what value of X minimizes that? I guess you could plug in zeros in there. Um, you could plug in zero, 15 over 26, five over eight. This is right, uh, at, uh, B was 15 over 26. It'd be a little tedious. In my opinion, not quite as easy, but um, 
But anyway, this was to me the easiest way to go about it, but you just didn't know how to do that. So for you, I guess the only thing you could do is plug the 5x minus 3 in there to get this, and then you start plugging your answers. Problem is you always have these none of these, which means it's possible that you can find the smallest one. 15 over 26 does give you the smallest expression when you do that, but you still don't know if it's a min or not. Um, because there could have been another one that gave you something lower. So you'd be taking a risk, guessing and checking. I would probably take that risk um, just because you've at least eliminated three of the of the five. And um, and you got you actually got an answer, but there might be some other X that actually gets even lower. So that's the only risk you take. Yeah. Number six. So number six. Okay, we actually talked briefly about these last year, and I don't know if you remember this, but I gave you a packet to go home with a bunch of systems on it, and we did it after our conics test, and you studied it. We came back, and we talked about it, and we had a quiz, um, but it was on solving systems, and one of the situations was these. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but this is a true statement. If I have an imaginary number and I square it, I'm going to get another imaginary number. For every imaginary number in the world, at least if it's an A plus BI form, if I have an imaginary number in A plus BI and I square it, I am going to get another A plus BI. Well, with that thinking, shouldn't I be able to square root any A plus BI and get back to its original imaginary number? Now, actually, when you square root one, there are two that could actually make me get, could get back to. But that's okay. So I'm making this assumption. So they told me to simplify 16 plus 30i. So I'm going to go, all right, I'm going to assume that there is another imaginary number. There is another imaginary number that the square root of 16 plus 30i is equal to. So again, this, pretend that the squares are not there yet, right? I'm saying I'm going to pretend that this square root is equal to some a plus bi. And then I'm just going to get rid of creative with my algebra. I'm going to square both sides which gets rid of my square root, but then I'm going to have to foil that out. So square the first, square the last, makes b squared i squared, which is negative b squared, that times that times 2. Now I'm going to go, all right, if this is true, then shouldn't this i term be equal to that i term? Because they're the only ones that have i's, right? So I made an equation of that. That i term is that i term. And this makes it easy to, I can then cancel an i and divide by a 2 and get to here. And if that's true, then shouldn't these non-i terms be equal to those non-i terms? And that gives me another equation. Now, at this point, I just have a system of equations, and you know how to solve a system. And that's why this was in that session. However, in 28 years, I've seen one time ever, right, one time out of, out of probably 50 to 100 of these, where the answers for A and B weren't whole numbers. So what I do is I just grab this thing and I go, well, what could make this true? And I just write down my options. Rather than solving the system, which could be messy, I just write down the options and guess and see which ones work over there. So the only numbers that can give me 15 are 3 and 5, negative 3, negative 5. And by the way, if it's a negative, then it's just plus, minus, minus, plus. Or 1 and 15, negative 1 and negative 15. Or switch the order, 5 and 3, negative 5 and negative 3, 15 and 1, negative 15, negative 1. And then I just plug them up there. And it's a lot easier to check them than you think. I mean, because really, most of them are going to be obviously not right. Like right here, 3 and 5. If I put a 3 and a 5 there and the biggest number's over there, it's going to be negative, right? Well, I can throw out anything whose bigger number is second. Right? Because that would give me a negative number. And, and this is positive in this problem. And then so then I look at these and I go, well, what, 15 and 1? There's no way 225 minus 1 is going to give you 16, so I can toss those. And I get down to these last couple, and I go, just let me double check them. 25 minus 9 is 16. Sweet. That works. That works. Well, those are my AB values. So just plug them back in for that. So 5 plus 3i, negative 5 minus 3i. And that's something we ought to be able to get because we, we've done that before, and I know it's been a while, so hopefully that was kind of a refresher. There's a good chance you'll see that again on one of these other tests. All right. All right. All right, I want everybody, when you're doing the odds, to come in here 
with one question at least, maybe two, that you want to know how to do so we don't have these down times. Some of y'all are just chilling. All right, so at least find a couple and be aware that somebody else might ask for yours. So have something you're ready to ask for just so we can utilize this time. And I don't feel like I'm pulling your teeth. All right. Oh no, different Lily. Okay. Never mind. That's why. Y'all have a great one.